because we are kings and our words matter. song talks about how with God all things are possible. I mean if you believe that all things are possible. If you've walked in here, if you're listening online through the internet or television, Jesus said all things are possible to him that believes. All things. Everybody say all things. No matter how difficult it may seem, it is possible my friend. If you've walked in here and you are ready to trust God, you are ready to look to God with everything you've got, put your faith and hope in God. If you're ready to believe that God is good and he'll do something good for you, all things are possible for you today. It is possible, my friend. Not only possible, it will happen. Let's sing it with that confidence in mind. Everybody clapping your hands. Like 
now he's not only thinking, but he loves you. It's amazing, so amazing, it's amazing. I am a friend of God, I am a friend of God. Think about your relationship with God, my friend. He treats you as a friend, not a friend in the low sense. No, no, friend in the highest sense. A best friend is sometimes matchless. <laughs> things you can tell your best friend, things in some ways your best friend can help you more than anybody else can help you in some ways, you know. And it is in that way when the Bible says, Jesus said to his disciples, I have called you my friends. He looked at Abraham and he considered him a friend. You are today a friend of God, my friend. That is the kind of relationship we have with Almighty God. Just think about that. There is nothing impossible for you. There is nothing that you can't get out of. There is nothing you can't get deliverance from. You have the most powerful friend in the whole world. And that is your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's today living for you, interceding for you. He is being more than a best friend can ever be. Let us continue to praise him, Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our Shepherd, our High Priest.
blood of the lamb.
you Lord we praise you oh Lord we lift you up in this place oh our hearts want to sing out before you words are not enough to describe how great you are how matchless you are how marvelous you are how glorious you are your splendor in your majesty in your beauty oh help us to see you as you truly are the risen Lord Jesus seated on the throne high and lifted up far above all principality, power, might and dominion. Oh, it is you we worship. A great God, an awesome God of power, of glory, of beauty, of majesty, of wisdom, of goodness, of truth. Oh, we praise you, we worship you, oh Lord. What an honor it is to stand here and worship you. And thank you, oh Lord, for honoring us with your presence in our midst. We thank you that you are here, the risen Lord Jesus is in our midst. The Spirit of God is here in our midst. We pray that the Spirit of God will continue to move mightily in our midst. Open the eyes of our understanding. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive your word. Anoint your servant mightily. Speak through him powerfully and clearly, O God. And may your word change and transform our lives and take us to a new level for your glory, O God. We come with the rest of the service into your mighty hands. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. You may be seated. Let's all continue to worship God by giving our tithes and offerings. Please get ready with your offering. Let's say this before we give. Jesus said, give, it shall be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men pour into your bosom. I believe what Jesus said. Lord, you are my source. I look up to you. I depend on you. So I give to you. Amen. As you're giving, we want to welcome newcomers to our church. If you're here for the first time in our church, would you please raise your hand? If you're here for the first time, kindly keep your hand raised until you receive a brochure from our ushers. Once you receive that brochure, you may put your hand down. 
Even if you see it outside, if you look inside that brochure, you'll see a white card. We want you to fill that out with your name and other details. After the end of the service, you may take that white card outside to the newcomer's desk. Just hand it over to them. They'll give you a free CD and a free uh, magazine on behalf of Pastor Sam and the entire AFT family. I take this opportunity to welcome you to our church. And we hope that you will continue to come and experience for yourself the wonderful things that God is doing in and through this church. Thank you. Please turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. Let me read verse 26 and then 31. We're going to read 26 and 31. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 31. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. We have been considering for the last two weeks, we've been looking at this new series, in which we've been considering the statement given here in the last verse of Genesis 1 and verse 26 also. The statement that says that God saw everything that he had made and saw that it was very good. Now, (laughs) we're trying to understand the meaning and purpose of material prosperity that God put in this world for man. Now, it is important I showed you to start our studies from Genesis chapter 1 and not begin somewhere else. Genesis 1 and 2 are perhaps the most important chapters in the whole Bible because they reveal very clearly what the will of God is, what the original purpose and the will of God is. Many things changed after the third chapter when man sins. The condition of this earth changed, human life changed, everything changed. But the first two chapters are a clear indication of what God originally wanted, originally intended for man. That's why the first two chapters are very important. It is because we read from the middle somewhere sometimes, we get mixed up with so many other ideas. We never arrive at the will of God by doing so. First two chapters are very important because they reveal to us the will of God for our life in our spirit, soul and body in every area of our life. Now, so we went to the first chapter to look at it and understand it because it is so important to have the right idea of material things so that we can have the right approach to material things. We can approach them in the right way, think about them in the right way, enjoy them in the right way, and use them in the right way. If you're idea of material things is wrong, then your whole life goes wrong in that particular area of your life. That is why it's so important. Now, (laughs) when God made everything and finally made man, then he, then the statement is made that it is very good. Now, (laughs) when God made man and gave him dominion over everything, the work of creation was over. You should understand this, that God created everything and the last creation was man. And with the last creation, it did something very significant. He blesses man and gives him dominion over everything. And with that, the work of creation is over. Then only God says it's very good. So when he said it's very good, he's referring to the fact that all of creation has been made and man has been made for whom all the creation has been made. So the two fit together. Creation is for man. Man is supposed to enjoy what God has made. And God puts him in charge and puts, gives him rule and reign over his creation. And he sees that and uh, says that it's very good. <coughs> By giving dominion to man over all creation, two things are clear. One, the dominion means that man must now be responsible to care for in a loving way 
care for the creation and develop it and cultivate it and work it and better it really. That is what man is given the responsibility for. So to have dominion means to care in a loving way for the creation. Secondly, dominion also means enjoyment of it, delighting in it. God meant these two things when he said, uh, uh, let them have dominion. One is to care for it in a loving way. The other is to enjoy it. Now we're going to look at the enjoying, enjoying God's creation. It's a very, I think it's a very important thing to look at this because this will set aright a lot of wrong ideas that have spread among Christians over the years concerning material things. But before we go into that, one minute, let's look back at the first item that I talked about. Last week we talked about how we need to care for material things. We showed that even though we don't worship the creation, we respect creation, we consider them as sacred. We love the creation of God because God said it's good, we consider they're holy, sacred, pure, and there's something very good about it. So Christians have a very positive attitude towards the creation of God. We don't demean creation. We don't look down upon creation. Just because we don't worship it, it doesn't mean that we don't respect it. We respect it and love it and literally consider it as sacred and pure. And we care for it, therefore. We don't abuse it, we care for it. Just like God cared for it. Remember, the earth was without form and void and darkness filled the face of the earth. And God lovingly cared for that chaos-filled earth, took it and made it into something that is beautiful and wonderful, filled with every good thing. His rule, God ruling over the creation, empowered and enhanced and bettered the creation. There was chaos, emptiness, darkness, all that is gone. Every good thing has been put in place. Everything functioning well. Everything has been made right and good. Some corrections were done. God fixed everything that went wrong with it. And it's a very important thing to look at it in that way. So, the rule of God, the dominion of God over the creation means that he empowered and uh, he enhanced the creation when uh, he took that creation and made it better. His rule never diminished or never oppressed creation in any way. Now that's why I preach the gospel many times from the first chapter. I say when you come to God and receive as, as your Lord and allow him to rule over your life, it is not the rule of some kind of a, uh, you know, horrible king. It is a rule of a wonderful savior, wonderful God, a loving God, who takes your life and makes something better out of it, makes it very meaningful and wonderful and so on. So this is the kind of dominion that God gave to man. When God created him and made him the Lord over his creation, and we created him in his image and likeness and made him the Lord over his creation. This is the kind of dominion. Just like God loved the creation. God delighted in the creation. God made everything better. Man is supposed to love, delight in it. Make everything better. Make every ennoble everything. That's the purpose. Now we looked at it last week when I talked about how we don't, ab we don't abuse and pollute nature and God's creation, we actually respect it. Now the most extraordinary thing about this human dominion that God gave to man, man ruling over the creation, is the application that it has for us today. What does it mean to say that man is over all the creation? There's something very important to understand. What does the Bible mean when it says that man has been made Lord over the creation? does not just mean that man has supremacy over the creation. It is true 
that man is not in level with creation, not on the same status and level with the creation. Some people believe that man and other creation are equal in status. No, we don't believe that. We man believe that man has supremacy over creation. Man is higher than all other creation. He's the highest of creation. Some, of, some people also believe that man is lower than the rest of the creation. Now, this idea that man is lower than the creation is seen in the fact that people, you know, sometimes worship the created things. They bow before the created things. They consider themselves as nothing but the creation or created things as something, something wonderful. We don't believe that. We believe that man has supremacy, humankind has supremacy over all other creation. But that's not the only thing. This idea that God made man in his image and likeness and said, let them have dominion is the thing that has become the foundation and basis for the modern day idea of human rights and all these things. You know, today we talk, hear a lot of talk about human rights, human dignity, inalienable rights of a human person and so on. Much talk is there. You know, it all came from this Protestant teaching of man's dominion over everything, man's supremacy over all creation. Therefore, he has the highest status among all creation. When God blessed man and said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish, and subdue and dominate over everything. When God said that, when God made man in his image and placed him in that way over all creation, he dignified and blessed man with the highest st creaturely status possible for anybody. You can't go any higher. That's why when the devil came and said, if you eat this fruit, the forbidden fruit, you'll become like God. That's a total lie. That's a false offer. You can't become better than what you are. God has placed you as high as possible. How can you go any higher? The only person that's higher than you is God. Everything else is under you. All of creation comes under man. Only thing that is higher than you is God. So when the devil comes and offers, makes this offer saying that if you eat this fruit, you'll become something better than what you are today, it's impossible. It is not possible at all. So God has blessed and dignified the human race with the highest creaturely status possible with this let them have dominion statement. Now, so we reject the idea that human beings are on the same level as other creation and even the idea that they are beneath the rest of the nature and so on. Now this, this Protestant teaching is the reason behind these very prosperous countries becoming very prosperous, innovative, uh, they have created a lot of things invented a lot of things, explored uh, the earth and its resources like never before, because it all stems from this Protestant teaching. If you read history, you will notice that ever since uh, the Protestant Reformation started and these ideas started taking hold, uh, there have been great advancement in science and technology as well as in uh, uh, material uh, resources being exploited to be used by man and to be enjoyed by man. All right, but let's look at the second aspect. Man is not only to care for the creation in a loving way, but he is uh, supposed to enjoy it and delight in it. Now, some people have a difficulty believing that God gave dominion to man so that he may have dominion in this way, enjoy everything that is there, and delight in everything that God has made. Now, when, God, when the Bible says that God saw everything that he had made and said that it is very good, that goodness of the earth, the statement about the goodness of the earth is the ground concept for something very important. Not only that he must be responsible to care for it, it's a ground concept for one more thing. And that is, that man can now, in a very right way, legitimate way, enjoy God's creation and delight in it. I said right way, legitimate way. Now some people, whenever you talk about enjoyment, immediately they think you're talking about something worldly. How can you talk from that pulpit about enjoying things, you know? When I first started out here, I started having youth meetings. I was at that time a youth myself. 
30 years ago. So I had youth meetings and I used to invite all the college students. I used to go to all these high schools and colleges and, and invite them to a meeting. And this place will be packed out back, even back then, you know, with young people. And some of the young people that came then are now today, you know, here still. And I used to do some wonderful things among them. And I printed some handbills and I, in my own way, I said, come and enjoy this whole day with us, you know, something like that. Come and enjoy. I mentioned enjoy. One preacher came to fight with me over that. He said, how can you say, come and enjoy? Is this a worldly event? How can you say, come and enjoy? I said, brother, is enjoyment worldly? He thinks enjoyment is worldly. How can you say, come and enjoy? But I know a wine shop that is named Enjoy Wines. They have these bright serial lights blinking. You can see it very far away. And this wonderful name board that they've got that's blinking also says, Enjoy Wines. Actually, the Bible says if you start drinking and the drinking takes over you, you'll become poor and you'll lose everything. That's what the Bible says. I hope they advertise it like that, you know. Just like they advertise that, advertised that uh, cigarette cons causes cancer. Nowadays, nobody smokes. It's not fashionable to smoke nowadays, you know. I hope they advertise it like that. You want to become poor? You want your wife to leave you? <laughs> you want to lose all your children, your job, your wealth, uh, your money, everything? Go ahead and drink. <laughs> visit our shop. Nobody will visit, you know. Soon they'll come to their senses. <laughs> Look at how they present it. Churches are there in a dull place with one little light that is barely turned on, you know, because they can't even pay the electricity bill for that because they're so godly. <laughs> they are so holy. They just worship under one bulb hanging from somewhere, you know. And these worldly people have it all lit up and they say, enjoy wines. See, enjoyment is relegated to the worldly and the sinful and so on. No. Enjoyment originally belonged to the realm of God. It has to do with good things, enjoyment of good things. I'm talking about enjoying in the right way. I am not talking about a worldly kind of, a sinful kind of enjoyment. I'm talking about a legitimate, right way of enjoying the good things that God has made for you and I to enjoy. There is a way to enjoy. There is a right way to enjoy the good things that God has created. Christians must understand that. We must not throw out the whole idea of enjoyment. Enjoyment is something that originated with God. Tainted by sin now so that people use the enjoyment in the wrong way. But God originally came up with the idea. So, when God said it's all good, He looked at the world and He knew why He has made this world. He's the creator. He knew. He knew the purpose. He has created the world to... Uh, he has created the world with a capacity and an ability to bring some delight and enjoyment for human beings. The earth is created in order to bring enjoyment and delight to human beings. God created the earth in such a way that human beings, when they live on this earth, they can derive some wonderful enjoyment from it, delight from it. Is that not true? That's why... You go all the way up to Kodekanal and it's a long ways. You go by train, then take a car and then throw up all the way up the, <laughs> up the mountain, you know. But you still don't mind. You get up there and you look at the beautiful sight, the mountains, the lake and the, you know, and the birds and the flowers. And it's an enjoyable thing. Just the air that you breathe there. Just the atmosphere, just the temperature there. Everything is so wonderful. You enjoy every bit of it. Right? Why? Because God has made Kodak Kanal with the ability to delight you, to enjoy, to bring joy to you, to bring some kind of enjoyment to you. I'm talking about that kind of enjoyment. God has made the earth, not just Kodak Kanal, but sun, moon and the stars, the fish and the birds and the animals and everything, the fruit-bearing trees, the herb-yielding seed, uh, 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 all 
creation have been created with the purpose of providing a legitimate good kind of enjoyment and delight to mankind. I'm talking about that, the legitimate good kind of enjoyment. So don't look at me like, what are you talking about enjoyment in church? Let's be real holy. I am holy. And we are talking about holy things. The creation is holy. That holy creation was created for your enjoyment and for your delight, to bring delight and enjoyment to you. Not only is the creation made with the capacity to give you some enjoyment and uh, delight, you are made with an ability to enjoy and be delighted with the creation. Hello? The two things go together. That is why when God saw the earth, which has the capacity to delight you, and saw a man who was now created also, in the image and likeness of God, who has the capacity to enjoy and delight in the creation. The two things fit wonderfully together. Here is something that is providing the enjoyment and delight. Here is something that has the capacity to enjoy and delight in that which has been made. And God said, it's very good. Hello? Everybody said, it's very good. <laughs> I can understand why God said, it's very good. Just the idea delights me. <laughs> God looks at the creation, he knew what the creation can do. He knew what kind of power was in creation, what kind of capacity was in creation. The creation has the ability to bring great enjoyment and delight in so many countless ways, endless ways, it can bring enjoyment and, and, uh, and, and, and delight to mankind. I told you the other day that, that God did not just see the world as he made it at that time. He saw all the possible things that in the future will come from the world that he has made. How man will literally explore and invent things from what God has made. So I told you airplanes fly today, not because man has made something or created something. Man has only discovered how an airplane can fly. All the physical laws necessary to fly an airplane was already in existence. The first day that God created the earth. The physical laws have been set in motion back then by God. Man only discovered it now. Adam didn't have any necessity for a 747. Where would he go? You know. So when man found a necessity for it, he becomes an inventor. He invents things to travel faster, to travel more efficiently and so on. So we've invented cars, we've invented buses, we've invented airplanes and, and even rockets. And, is, and so on, you see. And God only knows what all will be invented more. You know. He saw all of that way ahead of time because he's God. And that's why he said, it is very good. He knew that you and I will be traveling in an airplane one day. So comfortable. He said, it's very good. He saw that you and I will be traveling in a car instead of on a donkey. So that's why he said, very good. Hello. He saw that you and I will be living with great comfort and enjoy some of the comforts that these new inventions and findings bring to us. And he said, it's very good. Because the earth and everything that God has made has so much potential. The potential is endless, unlimited. You can go on inventing and come up with stuff. And God saw the amazing, endless, unlimited potential of his creation and he said it's very good and the inventor is man God saw the creation and the man who's going to take it and make something out of it God put gold underneath the earth but he put oil there coal there all of that is now tapped and brought out and used in a wonderful way it's all serving Mankind is bringing great delight to mankind, joy to mankind, so that we can pull up in a gas station and pump our car with petrol or diesel and drive on. My grandfather's day, he was working for the government, he was going by a bullock cart from village to village. Thank God I'm not living back then. <laughs> We're enjoying life today. And God saw all of this and said, it's very good. 
So remember this. When God said it's all very good, he saw the earth's potential and ability and capacity to bring enjoyment and delight to us. He saw our capacity, the human being's capacity, to enjoy and be delighted with all this creation. The two fit together so wonderfully. They belong together. That's why God said it's very good. All right? So, you must, we must get rid of the idea that everything material is bad. You must begin to see good in it. You know, some Christians are so holy, they've gone beyond God in holiness, you know. <laughs> They're holier than God, you know. Oh, that's not good. That's not, you know, that'll make you, that you'll be tainted with some kind of, uh, you know, evil or something, you know. So, I have heard people not even sleep in a good bed because that will make you proud. <laughs> I, I come from a background where we experienced, you are blessed people today, you know. I come from a background where these things were taught big time, you know. People will say that till today I sleep only in a straw mat because I don't want to be proud. Now we all sat there and said, Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord, brother, you know. Because we thought that's the way to be holy. And they kept us from enjoying all that God has made. Enjoying the development and the innovations and the creations that man has come up with for our convenience, for our benefit. They kept, they kept us from everything, you know. Even a car was criticized. And I remember even a scooter was criticized, you know, uh, back then. Uh, we had such a, uh, such a bad attitude about clothes and shoes and, and even things like shampoos and aftershaves. And, you know, we would rather stink than to, than to use these things, you know. Because our ideas were wrong we lived a wrong kind of life. Even our body was hated. We, we even disliked our body. We thought this is a body of sin and they'll find verses for it. And this is a sinful body. Therefore, this body must be despised. Then I found out in the Bible, the Bible says the body is for the Lord. Amen. It became a body of sin after Adam sinned. But... I am taught, that's why Genesis 1 is important. Paul, where did he get the idea when he writes in 1 Corinthians 6, 13, when he says the body is for the Lord and the Lord is for the body. He says some people live like this, food for the belly and belly for the food. That's their philosophy, you know. Why, does the belly, why is the belly there for food? And why is food there for the belly? He says, no, God will destroy both the belly and the food, he says. I'll tell you what the body is for. He says, the body is for the Lord and the Lord is for the body. What, a, what an amazing thought. Where did he get that from? That the body is for the Lord and the Lord is for the body. He looks at the body which is made of material things. The materiality of the body turns many Christians off. And they say, it's bad, it's evil, because it's material. But Paul says, it's good, it's for the Lord. That is the temple of God. That's the dwelling place of God. Therefore, glorify God, not only in your spirit, but also in your body. <laughs> Such a high ideal about the body. Because he goes back to Genesis 1. And verse 31, where after creating man with a body, with a material body, or after creating man whose body is made out of the dust of the earth, God says it's very good. And therefore he says, don't consider the body as bad, it's good. Yes, after sin entered, man has been using the body for a long time for bad. Don't use the body for bad, it's used to be used as a dwelling place of God. He says, this is the body through which God, in which God dwells and he moves through this body. He acts through this body. He does things through this body. So anytime you go to Genesis 1, 
your wrong philosophies will go out. To think that body is bad is wrong. Anything material is bad, that's the way a lot of people think, you know. Without the body, man cannot be fully human, right? If you take the body out, we'll be ghosts, you know. So without the body, you cannot be fully human. Body is very important. It has a purpose. God is not foolish, you know, to make a body. You know, God has not made a mistake by making us, giving us a body. God is a wise God. He never does anything bad and He made this body. Therefore, we consider even the body as sacred. That's the basis for our life of holiness. We do not indulge our bodies into things that are not pleasing to God because it's a temple of God. Therefore, we are careful with the use of our body. That's what Paul is saying. Flee from immorality, he says. How can you take this body and prostitute it, he says. You cannot use it like that. You have no right to use it like this. This body belongs to the Lord, he says. So he teaches whole moral life based on the fact that the body is good. You take the fact that the body is good out, you cannot even start teaching moral life. <laughs> then you get into the wrong kind of a moral uh, uh, morality where you say, you, you, this body brother one day is going to be destroyed so you can do with it whatever you want and uh, we will just get a new body, never mind whatever, what we do with this body. You know, that's wrong. This body that God gave us has a purpose, has a meaning and it is holy and pure because God is holy and pure and God is a good God and he said it's very good therefore it's good. So without the body, you know, I'm not a person. I am spirit, soul and body. Right? Now just like I am not a person without the body, the earth is nothing without material things. Why do we hate material things? Why do we think material things are unholy? What gives, some kind of religious, religious messed up philosophy has brought in this thinking that all the things that are earthly is unholy. No! If body is not unholy, it's holy and it's made of the earth. This dirt in the earth is what the body is made of. If this is holy, then what makes you think the earth is unholy? Hello? See how wrong we've gone? What makes you think that earthly things are unholy? I say to you today, by the word of God, that God made everything holy and pure. Therefore, we consider the creation as sacred. We believe that it's holy. So there's been a misuse now after sin has come. But we believe that God's original intention with all of his creation is that the earth, must, earth is, was created in a whole, in, with purity and holiness because it came from God, it's pure and holy. And therefore there is nothing wrong with this earth. Just like man without body is not man at all. Earth without material Riches, material wealth will not be earth at all. <laughs> so if earth is good and the body that came from the earth is good, then material things are good. Right? Now this is a very, this, this is an area where, you know, a lot of people get messed up. Back in the very second century itself, in the very early days of Christianity, you know, there was some messed up thinking in this area. You know, there was a philosophy going around in those days that said anything that is earthly is bad. Anything that is material is bad. Materiality is bad. And so what they decided, what they concluded was Jesus would not have been born as a real human being with a real body because body is evil because it belongs to the earth. Earth is evil, therefore body is evil, therefore Jesus did not have a true body. He had an apparition, just a, something looking like a body but didn't have a body. See where it's taking us. <laughs> I say to you, earth is good, the body that was made out of the earth is good. Jesus himself took on humanity 
it is possible to have this body and to have it as holy. I am talking about holy body. <laughs> I am talking about holy earth and things that have been made holy and pure by God. Let's think in those terms. All right. So, body is good. Earth is good. See, that's why when you look at the Garden of Eden, God made a man with the body, puts him in the Garden of Eden, where there is material riches. Here is a man with a material body. Living in a world with material riches and wealth. Extravagantly rich with material riches. You know. Now people talk, talk about this extravagance as, as something evil. But look at the Garden of Eden. If that is not extravagance, what is extravagance, my friend? For one man, four rivers. I thought two parts of water is enough. That's what they say. Each one will be given two parts of water. No, God said four rivers. Enjoy yourself. Such extravagance, much more than what man would ever need, God placed there in that garden. So man was created earthly with the body, put in an extravagantly furnished garden, and uh, he was to live upon this earth and exercise dominion over, over everything, cultivating, caring, and bringing forth the potential of the earth, because the earth has a lot more potential than what was seen at that time. And the end result of all that, as man works on the earth and goes to exploring the earth, finding out all that is possible uh, from the earth, all that he can make from the earth, and uses his creativity and God-given wisdom to bring out many things uh, that will make human life even more delightful. The end result of all that is human enjoyment and delight. The result is human enjoyment delight. When they discovered all these motor vehicles, it was for human delight and enjoyment. Right? When they discovered the airplane, it was for human delight and enjoyment. You don't have to travel in a ship for two months to get to America. You know. It is for our delight and enjoyment. Everything was made and man was put there to literally explore in endless ways the delight and enjoyment that it can bring. So the Garden of Eden is nothing but a vision of this truth. When, you, when I see the Garden, I love the first two chapters. It's the vision of this truth that God wants to convey. So man is like a king. He owns the whole thing. He's supposed to delight in it. Like a king, he's, got, he's supposed to use everything. He's supposed to enjoy everything. Now this enjoyment of pleasure is totally different from the wrong kind of enjoyment of pleasure that is called hedonism. Now what hedonism is? Hedonism is pleasure as an end in itself. Pleasure seekers were filled with covetousness and nothing is ever enough and they want more and more and more. That kind of a evil approach to life. This, what I'm talking about is not like that. This is not hedonism. This is not pleasure as an end. This is talking about pleasure as a part of this life that God has made for us. God wants us to enjoy and have pleasure in the things that he has made in the right way. So man was placed with a body made from the earth, which most people think is bad. Anything that is material is bad. God made the body with that and placed man in a garden which was rich with earthly resources. From gold to everything was there. Gold was growing there, it says. And man was furnished with all the best things possible. And this is the condition in which he was to encounter God, fellowship with God, with God every day. Listen to this. In Garden of Eden, in that rich place, living in total extravagance, man was to live in fellowship with God. God visited man every day. 
in the cool of the day he walked with man some people think if you are rich you cannot even have any relationship with god so long they preach saying that if you are rich you can't even go to heaven they think that's what the bible teaches that if you are rich you can't go to heaven you know and here the bible says the first man was rich had no lack no want of anything yet he walked with god every evening hello this is the atmosphere see look at what kind of atmosphere some people think think if you are poor you will want god more if you are hungry that you will seek god more that you will be a holy person you will live a holy life and so on so if that is the truth see if that is what the truth is then the first two chapters must reflect that god should have made an earth with very poor poverty stricken earth and kept man with 100 grams of rice every day 50 grams of dal two brinjals uh, and half a liter of kerosene <laughs> ration everything out and limit his resources so that he'll be holy and pure and seek god and pray more <laughs> he didn't do that he puts him in an absolutely extravagant place of everything in abundance far beyond anything that he could ever imagine man had everything and there in that atmosphere of abundance man was to know god encounter god walk with god and live with other human beings this is what god's will is hello i think some people are shocked that's the good news the bible is full of good news my friend if you thought any other way you better start think rethinking <laughs> so bodily life is essentially good god wants man to be filled with every good thing see one one of the things he says is in cha- chapter 2 in genesis after he put man in that garden with the extravagance more and more of everything that man would ever need much more than he would ever need and then he says this in verse 16 and the lord god commanded man saying of every tree of the garden you may freely eat now you may freely eat does not mean that he doesn't have to pay for it that's not the sense in which the word freely is used when he said you may freely eat of all the trees of the garden he was saying with liberty with total freedom you have the freedom and the liberty is is to eat of every tree of the garden i like the tamil i pre- preach in tamil the first two services so i get a good dose of tamil language and english language the same verse which he says freely eat is translated in tamil like this thotathirulla ella virukshangalin kaniyum pusikave pusipa it's enough to say pusikalam it's enough to say you can eat he says pusikave pusipai why should he say pusikave pusipai because he knows that some of these people will object and doubt whether they can eat all of it because there's too much and if they ate all of it they'll be sinful or greedy or you know and so on so that's why he says pusikave pusikalam that means be sure and understand this that you can truly eat you have all the freedom and all the liberty to eat of every tree of the garden now from a lot of christian preaching that i have heard it looks like god and god put man in a garden which had just enough of what every man needed because more means he'll be spoiled he cannot live a holy life which had just enough and god delivered manna from heaven daily bread and they have verses for it they will immediately take you to the wilderness journey of the people of israel they say god gave manna every day they were supposed to pick up their manna so your approach to life must be that you must have daily bread every day daily bread is it there in the bible is manna there in the bible yes the problem with these people is they started reading only from exodus that's the thing you got to read from genesis and genesis 1 is where you must start whenever you don't read from genesis 1 you go wrong because genesis 1 and 2 is the original will and purpose of god 
Does the Bible talk about the wilderness journey of the people of Israel from Exodus to Deuteronomy or uh, Joshua and talk about the manna coming down from heaven for 40 years? Yes, it does. But is it God's will? I say to you emphatically, no, that is not God's will. It is, is it there? It's there. Did God do it? Did God send manna, daily bread? Yes. But is daily bread the will of God? I say to you, no, never. Then what is the will of God? Eden. Not daily bread. If it was daily bread that is the will of God, God would have put Adam and Eve in a garden with nothing and said, don't worry, I will drop it every day. The daily bread was an emergency measure. See, when there's a war going on or flood or something, some emergency happens, they will drop potlon, you know. Food packets from the, from the helicopters. They'll drop food packets and we have to rush and go get it, fight over it and get our food packet, you know. The manna was like the food packet. God delivering it every day. This is not the way people are supposed to live. Does anybody in this country or any country say food packets will be delivered every day? Dropped on your house, you know. You better come out and get it. No, that's not the way people live. People go to work, earn so much money, and they buy whatever they want. They eat chicken today, mutton tomorrow, day after tomorrow they eat fish. You know, they can go to this restaurant, eat that restaurant. They can do whatever they want because they got plenty of money. You know, they have the freedom to explore and eat whatever they want. That's the will of any state or government or anything. But in emergency periods or in, in periods where there is an emergency happening like a flood or something, disaster, Food packets are dropped. For 12 days they are supposed to travel through the wilderness and God was going to show his mighty power by providing the manna from heaven for just 12 days to show that he is the provider, that he can miraculously and marvelously provide. And they extended the journey for 40 years. That's the miracle of miracles. Now suppose you can go from here to Tambaram in one hour, and if it took you one year, wouldn't, wouldn't you say that's a miracle? <laughs> For these people it took 40 years till they didn't arrive there. But God was gracious. They would have died if it was not for the manna. Every day he provided manna for them. Did he do it? Yes. But is it the will of God? I say no. It was never the will of God they should be there 40 years. It was never the will of God they should be fed with manna every day. If it was the will of God, then why would he say, I will take you to a large and a vast land flowing with milk and honey. And when they arrived there in the promised land, the Bible says the manna stopped. If it's the will of God, why did he stop it? Thereafter, no manna. The people of Israel lived without the manna. What is the will of God? The land flowing with milk and honey. What is the land flowing with milk and honey? It is back to Eden. God has got Eden in his mind. So he's reproducing Eden in the land flowing with milk and honey, the land of Canaan. He is bringing them into again Eden again. God has never changed his plan. God has never changed his opinion. He has no two ideas and he's not confused and whether this kind of life is good, that kind. He's got only one thing in mind. Eden is the best way to live. That is the way to live. That is the will of God. So that he picks them from slavery and brings them into a large and vast land flowing with milk and honey. Amen. <laughs> So Eden tells me something. When I look at the first two chapters, it tells me something. That when God made Eden, the way he made it and the way he provided everything in the Garden of Eden shows me that God wants to set mankind free from every want and need of any kind and from every kind of servitude and slavery. Man should never be a slave to want and needs and insufficiency and lack and poverty. The way he made Eden, I challenge you to think any other way. The way he made Eden and prepared it for man shows that God wanted to eradicate. Garibi hatta wonrang. He wanted to get rid of poverty. 
do away with poverty. That's why he took the earth that was without form, void, there was nothing there, void, empty, and full of darkness. He said, no, 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 this is not the earth I want. I want to make it into an earth that is filled with every good thing, with light, with order, and every good thing. So he made a different kind of earth filled with every good thing. And in that earth he made a garden even more as an habitable place for man. And the way he made the Garden of Eden shows us that God does not want any lack or want or poverty for anyone. He wants to get rid of it, eradicate it totally and completely. And that man must live there. See, just imagine, if, it, if the world was with, uh, without form and void and filled with uh, darkness, and if God put a man in there, in that condition, man cannot dream anything. He cannot live there dreaming and doing things. No, no, no. He'll be just trying to survive. To survive itself will be a big thing. In the darkness, in that emptiness, there is nothing. And man would have not survived. But God didn't put man in that condition. God put man in a world that was filled with every good thing so that man can now dream. People are so busy just trying to make hand-to-mouth existence, they have no time to dream. When there is lack and want, there is no time to dream. You dream in this condition, in the condition where life is like the Garden of Eden. You have everything, but the dream keeps you alive. I remember one time I was watching a man who was 90 years old, still going to his office. He was a big, rich businessman, going to his office every day. He'll be the first one there, it seems. And uh, they asked him, why do you still go to your office? You don't, you don't need it. You're a multi, multi billionaire. Why do you go to office? He says, because if I don't go, all these MBAs will starve. <laughs> More than that, he says, I'm dreaming a dream. That's what keeping me alive and healthy, he says. I have a dream inside of me. I have everything. I don't need anything. So I have all the time free. I don't have to worry about this and that and who will pay the rent and who will buy me. I don't, I don't have all the common worries. So at 90 years of age, I dream. I dream of doing this. I dream of doing that. I dream of going there. I dream of achieving this. God wanted man to dream. That's why he put him in a garden of Eden with everything provided so that man can dream. And man can use his creativity and explore the earth and work in productive and rewarding ways and reap the fruit of all his labor and the end result of his enjoyment, delight. What a nice atmosphere to live. <laughs> eh? Blessed life. You can dream, you can be creative, you can go to work. Work hard to really produce something, whatever you're dreaming. Work hard to really achieve something, something that is in your heart, some dream you have in heart. And see it done, achieved. And derive pleasure from it. God says, that's the way I want human beings to live. Hello. That's why when he saw the earth, and saw the man made in the image and likeness of God, having dominion over the earth, he said, it's very good. Why? Because he realized that all of these things will happen. God didn't make the Garden of Eden and say, I will deliver food packets every day. Manna is not God's will. Abundance and plenty is God's will. Rationing out stuff is not God's will. Having much more than what you need is God's will. God is against all servitude and want. Being a slave to want and slave to lack and insufficiency. God is against that. He got rid of it in the beginning. And made this Eden which was full of every good thing. Genesis 1 and 2 is an assault on barrenness. God does not want barrenness, emptiness. He took the world, that earth was, that, is, that was empty and filled it with every good thing. So, 
Genesis 1 and 2 tells us something very definite that abundance, fruitfulness and extravagance and excess are the proper conditions for a life full of delight. Now try to digest it. I know it's very difficult to digest it if you've, if you've been brought up in a certain tradition. It was difficult for me to digest also. It took a while, you know. But that's it. This is the proper condition for a life full of delight. So, as Christians, we need to discern between the right kind of delight that pleases God, that God wants for us, and the wrong kind of delight that is sinful and bad. Not all delight is bad. There is a right way of delighting and enjoying what God has made. Now, when you understand this, you'll immediately understand the rest of the Bible. When you understand Genesis 1 and 2, you'll understand the rest of the Bible. When you don't read the first two chapters and don't understand this, then you don't understand a lot of other things. Like a lot of people have a problem with Abraham, Isaac, Joseph and J J Jacob and so on, you know. Because they're all rich. And here they're preaching poverty and this is a big hindrance to them. Every time they come to Abraham, here is a rich man. And they've been preaching that rich man can cannot go to heaven. But Jesus says they're all up there in heaven, you know. So this is all big hindrance. They're preaching on the one hand that you can't go to heaven if you're rich. And then Jesus says the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are there in, the, in heaven. They're going to all sit one day together and have a banquet, you know. They say, what is this? Where I'm preaching so hard against riches and here this rich man is in heaven? Just imagine what kind of surprise the poor Lazarus would have had when he landed up, landed up in the bosom of Abraham in heaven. He would have turned around and said, Father Abraham, what are you doing here? They told me you won't be here. Father Abraham would have given him one on his head and said, you are ashamed to me. Have you heard of Abrahamic blessings? You know, which church have you been going to? Who taught you to be poor? Who glorified poverty for you that you lived in poverty all your life, even though you are a seed of Abraham? Don't you know about the blessings of Abraham? See, so many people have formed uh, wrong ideas. So when they come to Abraham, Isaac, Joseph, and Jacob and all that, they have a problem with all those stories because every one of them is rich. Super, super rich. Even people of Israel, when, they brought, when God brought them out of Israel, they were loaded. You know, they were poor, but they were now loaded with riches. They came out with gold and silver. The Bible says that. And Moses and Israel's, Israelites were not promised food packets from heaven every day. They were promised a promised land. A land of Canaan flowing with milk and honey. Where life will be wonderful. Jesus himself proclaimed the kingdom of God. As a great messianic feast. <laughs> People get frustrated with that. Why couldn't he explain the kingdom of God as anything, as something else? Why as a feast? Plus, when he was in this earth, all the time he was eating dinner with all these guys, you know. That really upset a lot of people. In Matthew chapter 11, see, I want, to, I want, to, I want you to realize something here. Matthew 11 verse 8. 18. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they, and they say he has a demon. Look at this. He came neither eating nor drinking. He is always fasting. And they said he had a demon. Listen to this. The son of man came eating and drinking. The complaint about Jesus and his disciples was they were all eating all the time. Going and coming they were eating. They'll come and say, where is Jesus? He's eating with the tax collector today. Next day they come looking for him, they say, he's eating with that Pharisee's house tomorrow in dinner. He's eating somewhere all the time, he's dining somewhere. So John came not eating and drinking, he was a fast, fasting man, you know, big on fasting. Jesus came as an eating man. They called John demon possessed. And when Jesus came eating and drinking, they say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But then Jesus 
adds his comment on it. He says, but wisdom is justified by her children. That's very high English. I'll say it very simply. Those who have any brain will understand what is right, he says. That's exactly what he's saying. Those who have any sense to understand what is right, what is wrong, will understand that eating and drinking, the, the fact that Jesus dined all the time, is not sinful. Some people would think so, you know. All, all of this, you cannot categorize all of this into gluttonous and, and so on, drunkenness and gluttonous. You know. Not so. Jesus describes the heavenly feast and the kingdom of God as a great messianic feast. Remember that woman that came and broke open a jar of precious ointment that was worth one whole year of an average man's wages? Judas couldn't, couldn't take it. Couldn't take what? Couldn't take the extravagance. And moreover, he couldn't take the fact that Jesus saying, let her pour, don't, don't bother her. Let her pour it on me. Let her do it. And he said, my God, one year's wage is going down the drain. Maybe a couple of hours it'll smell good, after that it's gone. One year's wage. He couldn't stand the extravagance. We'll come to it later on. But if you understand Genesis 1 and 2, you'll never have any problem with the way the Bible teaches about Abraham, Isaac, Joseph, Jacob, and, and others, you know, and the blessings of God and so on. And the only reason the Bible condemns wealth is where the wealth is being misused and God's riches and blessings are abused by sinful men and women. That is the way condemnation happens. And that you find plenty of places. I have no problem with that also. I would condemn it also, the way it was used. If you had the wrong kind of enjoyment and delight over wealth, certainly it is condemnable. But we are talking about the right kind of enjoyment and delight of God's blessings over our lives. Now I want to read one more, just one thing and, and, and just close. William James, a great man that lived about 150 years ago, said this. He, he explored a lot about human mind and, uh, and, and the and the human nature and so on. He had a lot of good things to say. He's talking about animals versus humans. What makes the difference? What uh, differentiates humans from animals? He says this, man's chief difference, it's old English, so I'll, I'll explain a little bit. Man's chief difference from the brutes lies in the exuberant excess of his subjective propensities. Subjective propensities, he's talking about the uh, inclinations, desires that are found in man, that is embedded in man. Those inclinations and desires are always desires for the extravagant, exuberant excess, he says. Too much, man wants too much, he aims so high. He wants things beyond uh, what one should need. He is not satisfied uh, with the basic necessities. You can't satisfy man with just food and water and a place to live. If you just give him the basic necessities, he is not satisfied. Man aims, keeps aiming, keeps shooting for the moon all the time. The propensities that are hidden in man, subjective, inside of man, are so different from animals, he says. That's the thing that distinguishes animal from man. Have you seen any dog that said, I want to look for a better house because I think it will be good to have some air conditioning? Hello. <laughs> are you, have you ever seen a pig that desired to live in more clean place, a better, clean, cleaner place? You'll never find it. No pig is com complaining about it cleanliness. Are there any animals aiming higher? Do they have these extravagant thoughts? I want, it, I want this, I want that and so on. No. Only human beings. He says this is the thing that distinguishes humans from animals. Their 
likings for these great things, things that are beyond uh, their reach that they want to somehow get and enjoy. He says, they say, uh, he says, his preeminence, that is man's preeminence over them, over the animals, lies simply and solely in the fantastic and unnecessary character of his wants. <laughs> Look at that. Man and animals are different mainly because of the unnecessary character of his wants. Man wants things that are not necessary, but he still wants them. This is what distinguishes human being from others. Man, man is not satisfied with basic necessities. Yes, more, yet most of the Christian teaching is aimed at telling us that you should have nothing more than basic necessities. Centuries together, it has been taught that you should not have anything more than basic necessities. If you had anything more than basic necessities, you are sinning. If you had one penny more than basic necessities, you are sinning. But yet, God has made man in such a way that his heart desires high things, lofty things, better things all the time. He wants to go higher and higher. And his desire the nature of his desire is so different. He desires things that are unnecessary for him, but he still desires it. He can sleep very well in this bed, but he wants a better one. He can live very well in this house, but he wants to build a better house. You know, this, this is the way he goes. Man, this man desires, man's desires are like that. He says, his preeminence over them lies, over animals, lies simply and solely in the fantastic and unnecessary character of his wants. Physical, moral, aesthetic and intellectual. So that's why man has great delight in uh, keeping his body well. Right? Have you ever gone out and bought a nice piece of clothing and put it on? You feel so elated. It gives you a wonderful feeling. You buy something nice for a dog, it won't have any appreciation. That's why Jesus said, don't throw pearls before pigs, you know. Because pigs don't understand pearls. But human beings, you give a pearl to your wife, boy, she will have a good time, you know. You will lift her spirit sky high. Human beings are made like that. But this was condemned all the time. Human beings are made by God like that. They like the finer things, better things, more wonderful things. This is the way human beings are made. But yet this was condemned all the time, saying that it is bad. But human beings are made like that. When it comes to their physical life, even if they just lose some weight. Hello? If people lose a little bit of weight and start looking better, they feel all elated, happy over it. But no pig is elated over it. It's putting on weight. They keep feeding the pig, you know, all the time, you know. And the pig keeps eating, not knowing they're going to kill the pig as soon as it gets fat, you know. Not only physically, morally. Now, this moral aspect has been covered a lot by a lot of people, you know. We always heard preachers talk about how man has a moral inclination to be pleasing to God, to know God and so on. That aspect they have talked about a lot. But they leave out the other aspects. Morally, there is something inside of man that seeks God and wants God and so on. That is a known fact. Animals don't want but man wants. Aesthetic. Aesthetic is the sense for that which is good, beautiful. That's why you and I can stand in Kodekanal and say it's beautiful. No pig is going to stand in Kodekanal and say it's beautiful. It doesn't care about what we We have a sense of beauty. We, when we look at beauty, we know that it's beautiful. Aesthetic and intellectual mind. The mind of human beings are very um, complex. Man can think very deeply and think very thoroughly and animals can't do that. And then <coughs> he says, prune down his extravagances and sober him 
and you will undo, undo him. He says, if you teach him to cut down his extravagances and sober him and tell him you should not desire these things, you should not want these things, you should not care for these things, then you'll make him, make him something less than a man that's made in the image and likeness of God. Why is man like that? Have you ever wondered that? Why is man like that? Why man gets so happy when he just gets in good shape in physically? Why can he go just go buy some piece of cloth and wear it and, and he feels all elated? Why can he just have a haircut even, you know? Or ladies have hairdos, you know, and feel so happy about it. What makes them feel so happy about it? Why shaving and putting on aftershave makes people so happy? No pig will, you'll find asking for an aftershave, you know. When I was young, just starting to shave, I didn't know how to shave. I used to go to a barber, you know, just coming up, shaving. Once a week I'll go and he'll shave. And I'll wait for him to splash that aftershave on me. Because in my house, no aftershave was allowed. Because <laughs> we were holy people. So he will just put that on me, splash it on me and make, ah, that made me feel so high. I felt so happy, I'll wait for that, you know, till the last moment when he does that. And then you have to be careful when you enter the house, you know, <laughs> because you can't have that. Why does it lift you up as a human being? Because you are made to enjoy and have delight in these wonderful things that God has made and kept in this world. So human delight is an expression of the fact that God has literally given dignity to man and that God's glory can be seen in man. That man is something very special. Man is, has supremacy over all other creation that is higher than everything else. Something has happened, in, see when you see a man well and prosperous and blessed, that means something has happened inside of him. This outward manifestation of blessing is only an outward manifestation of what has already happened inside. It's like the sacraments of baptism and communion, you know, where it's an outward thing of what has already happened on the inside. Blessing and prosperity is like that. It's an outward thing of what has already taken place by the grace of God inside, that you are a blessed and you are a child of God. Amen? Let's all stand up together. We'll continue next week. Let's lift up our hands and thank God. Praise you, Jesus. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come. We thank you, Lord, for your wonderful word. We thank you for speaking to our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for you have made us in your image and likeness to be like you, to walk with you, and to live in the way that you have ordained originally for us to live in. We thank you for you have created everything and called it good. And this kind of life good, the blessedness good, the prosperity good, the abundance good. And I pray for blessedness, prosperity and abundance more than enough for every person, for every family in this place. May they be blessed beyond measure and reflect this glory of God every day of their lives. We give you all the glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with each and every one of us for now and forevermore. Amen.